time to be taking your Bibles and open them to the book of 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. We're going to be looking at verses 1 through 4 uh, this evening. Verses 1 through 4 of 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. We've entitled it tonight, Living by Faith. God wants you and I as individuals and as a church to move and live and operate by faith and not by sight. So we want to look at that tonight and live and operate and move in our own lives as well as our church by faith. And I don't know of a better church than to pick out for an example than the church of Thessalonica. Uh, They were the New Testament model church. And uh, the reason for that was because it was a church that moved and operated by faith. And what God wants us to do and how He wants us to live. So we're going to look at that this evening. So uh, let me take a moment to welcome all of you that are watching by Rumble Live this evening. Thank you for tuning in with us. I trust that uh, many of you watched this morning or maybe this afternoon as it was reloaded up. And that you were blessed by the message of God this morning as we looked at finding grace in a godless world and society that we live in. And so we're looking at the life of Noah and his generation and what went on. And so praise the Lord for that. Facebook, good to have you with us as we uh, send it to you from Rumble and share it with you. And you can click on the link there. I mean, just it's right there in front of you. Just click it and boom, the outline will open right up for you. Really easy and you can print it out with no problem. And so, praise God, praise God. So, I trust you all have your Bibles open now to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, beginning, let's read verses 1 through 4, and then we're going to get and take a look into this model church of the New Testament that lived by faith. And so, that's how we want to live tonight, is by faith. So, Paul, unto the church of the Thessalonians, which is, now you all circle a little word, in God. Notice uh, the church is in God. Amen. See, the church tonight has to be in God the Father and in, another little preposition there, the Lord Jesus Christ. Very important that the New Testament church needs to be in God and in Jesus Christ. If it's not, then I question whether it's a true church or not. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to God always for you all, making mention mention of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing, and here he goes, he lists his three things that they are remembered for, remembering uh, without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope, notice, in our Lord Jesus Christ, in the sight of God and our Father, Knowing, brethren, beloved, your election of God. Aren't you glad you're elected tonight? See, any church that's in God and in Christ and in the Lord Jesus is an elected church. Okay, because it's made up of elected believers. So praise the Lord for that. Father, thank you for tonight. We bless you, Lord. We thank you. We give you praise and honor and glory. And we ask now for you once again to give us illumination, understanding of the scriptures. We ask you to give us wisdom to apply what we're going to learn tonight. Thank you for these that have come out. I pray, Lord, you would bless them in several ways, Lord. Bless them for being faithful and committed and dedicated to coming out to your house tonight. Lord, it's hot, it's warm, it's a beautiful day, and I'm sure they probably want to be doing other things, but God, they set aside the time to put you first in their life and come to church tonight. So, Father, I pray you'd bless them for that and reward them accordingly, Lord. And we thank you for it. Thank you for the service we had this morning. Today, thank you for the wonderful offering we had this morning, God. You know our needs and you have met our needs. And we give you all the praise and glory and honor for it. Now, precious Holy Spirit of God, we ask once again that you would anoint your servant in this hour, that you would give him freedom and liberty uh, to proclaim the truth of God's word. We ask for power and that anointing that can only come from you as we stand in this place tonight to proclaim your truth, the word of God. And Father, we'll thank you for it and praise you for it in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, what? Amen and amen and praise the Lord. 
All right, as just a way of a little introduction, follow along with me. And I trust that this would be your testimony to Ellis tonight. This is kind of my testimony. And it was this church's testimony. And I trust and, and hope that it would be your testimony. And that is right off the bat, I believe God. Okay, can you say that tonight? That I believe God. And that's what we need to do. We need to believe God. Matter of fact, I believe that God is able to do anything but fail. God is able to do anything but fail. He is able to do above all that we can, uh, are able uh, to think. Amen. How many believe that tonight? Matter of fact, in, in Ephesians 3.20 there, the Bible says, Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we can ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. Man, what a, what a promise we have there of God. And notice, he's able to do abundantly above all that you and I can think or even ask. And notice how he does it, according to the power that works in us. That's God's power in us. And so praise the Lord for that. We praise God for that. I believe tonight, and certainly as a church, that all spiritual work uh, begins and continues by faith. All spiritual work must continue and begins and continues by faith. That's how this church was started. It's how it continues even to this day that the spiritual work that's done here is done uh, and it continues by faith. That's why you see the back of your bulletin, what you have there, everything you see on the back of that bulletin was an act of faith. It was an act of faith on behalf of the people of this church and the, and the folks that were here when we started all that and how it has grown and expanded is because of faith and believing God by faith. And Paul remembered their work of faith. He remembered their labor of love and he remembered their patience of hope. That's what he said. We remember this and we pray this about this church of Thessalonica. And that ought to be our testimony tonight. And he remembers their work of faith, their labor of love and their patience of hope. That's what he prays for, and that ought to be our testimony of our church. Would you agree with me on that? We ought to be a church, a work of faith. We ought to be a people, a labor of love, and that's work, labor, all right? And we ought to have patience of hope, okay? We need to understand that the ministry of the church, we must go back to the origin of the church in Acts chapter 17. And so if we're going to understand and have an understanding of this ministry tonight of the church of Thessalonica, we've got to go back to Acts 17, and that's where it's recorded there of, of this church. And so you don't need to turn. I'll just give it to you here a little bit. You can see it there. And the first thing that Paul did, he went into the synagogue in verses 1 and 2 of Acts 17, and he reasoned with them about the Scriptures. Okay, and then in verse 6, if you read there in Acts chapter 17, you'll find that the church was accused of turning their world upside down for Jesus Christ. Wow, what a testimony of, the, of these Thessalonian believers at Thessalonica. And that's what it, way it ought to be with us. And so what was the results of all of this going on in this church? Well, when you get to verse 6 of chapter 17 of Acts, it said they became followers of Paul and the very next line, and they became followers of the Lord. And then when you get to verses 7 and 8, it says that they were an example. These were an example uh, uh, to all of Greece, uh, there to Macedonia, and so forth. And so we praise God for that. And so let's take a look, if we can, as we get into this tonight. So let's look at the three characteristics of the church of Thessalonica in verse 3 of 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. Everybody back in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. All right, verse number 3 again. This is our text verse for tonight. Remembering without ceasing, notice, your work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God our Father. All right, and we saw that they became followers of, of Paul. They became followers of the Lord. It's right here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 7 and 8. Look at, so that we were examples to all that believed in Macedonia and Achaia. For from you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith to Godward is spread abroad so that we need not to speak anything. What a testimony of these believers in Thessalonica. So let's take a look at it right off, uh, get going here. First of all, notice what was the first thing Paul said. They had a working faith. 
They had a working faith. So let's uh, discuss a little bit about what faith is. Faith is trust in God. Faith is trust in God. If we're going to have a working faith in our church, folks, we're going to have to trust in God. If we're going to have any work here at all and do any work for the Lord here, we're going to have to trust God. That's a working faith. So I'll draw your attention to Hebrews now, chapter 11, verses 1 through 6, and we'll read here. Let's take a look and read it, verse 1 here. The Bible says, now faith, here's the definition of faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. All right, there we go. Everybody got that? So what do we see? What is faith is a trust in God. And so what is faith? Faith is the substance of things hoped for. In other words, faith is certain of God's promises. Faith is certain of God's promises. Now when God's made a promise, we need to have the faith to trust it and believe it. Amen? Amen. Now we sometimes we get a little nervous around here, especially me, when finances and the church get a little bit down. And I start getting a little worried as the pastor. And, uh, you know, okay. And sometimes we have to trust and believe God that He shall, will supply all of our needs according to whose riches in Christ Jesus. And so by faith we trust in that even though we haven't seen it. Amen. It's certain of God's promise. Then he also said faith is the evidence of things not seen. That is, in other words, faith is confident of God's power. So we need to, have, we need to be certain of God's promises And we need to be confident in God's power. That's what he's talking about. Faith is trust in God. A working faith. That's why Ephesians 3.20 now says, Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us. Another thing about faith tonight, faith believes that God lives. How many believe God lives? All right, look at verse 6 of of Hebrews there. It's in your notes there. Look at verse 6. All right, everybody with me in verse 6? But without faith, it is impossible to please Him. For he that cometh to God must believe that He is. You've got to believe that God is God, and you've got to believe that God lives. That's what your faith does. See, and if we're going to have a working faith here, church, in our lives as individuals and as a church, then we need to believe that God lives. Amen? Simple as that. And what else did it say in that verse? Finish reading it. And that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So our faith needs to believe that God is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. And when we're seeking him, God is going to reward us. And we got a wonderful reward this morning. You see, as a reward from God. And so we praise God for that. Amen. You see, that's faith. And by the way, when we saw that, it's the evidence of things not seen. Number five there, God does not always show you what comes later. See, that would be sight, and God wants us to live and walk by faith. Okay, And and, and Paul said he was remembering the the church of Thessalonica in his his prayers uh, for their work of faith. They, they, they were the model church of the New Testament, and they had such a, a, a powerful testimony of faith. Well, folks, we're, they're no different than we are. Matter of fact, we've got more than they got. Yeah. Amen. They did not have the Word of God. They had the apostles to preach to them that the Spirit of God gave them what to say in the Word of God, but the, written, the Word of God, the New Testament, was not written. I mean, we've got more than what that church had. Okay, and so praise God. I mean, so there's no reason why we can't do that. Don't say, well, that was the church of Thessalonica 2,000 years ago. And by the way, Pastor, you know, things are different. Amen. Things are changed. You know, if you go back and study these churches and in their time period and their culture, they faced the same problems we face today. Amen. And they had to deal with some of the same stress and the same testings, same trials and everything we did. You don't think those people didn't have problems? You don't think they didn't have aches and pains and health issues? Come on now. And they didn't have surgeons and doctors to go to. Hello. I mean, they they didn't have what we had. But you know what they did have that we lacked? Faith. They had faith. And so there's no reason why we can't have faith. Amen. Uh, So we know, first of all, we know, A, there, faith is trust in God. If we're going to have a working weight. And secondly, faith serves God. Faith serves God. In Hebrews 13, 6, it says there, so that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. 
See, the Lord is my helper. Faith serves God, and therefore I will not fear what man shall do unto me. We don't have to fear what the government's going to do to us. What are they going to do to us? They may kill us, but they can't eat us. That's against the law. Amen. Amen. And if they do, all they're going to do is just usher us to heaven a little bit quicker. So, I mean, so, so hey, they, they maybe do some of us a favor. Amen. I mean, you know, we need to trust God that, hey, man, we need not to fear what man, the government, the administration, what they can do to us. Now, they do a lot of threatening. And sometimes they follow through with some of their threats. Amen. But we've got to take a stand. And as we move closer into the end times and the minutes of the hours and the minutes of the coming of the Lord, things are going to get tougher and things are going to get rougher. And if this ministration continues to go the way it's going, it's going to get rougher. It's going to get tougher in the months ahead. You mark my word for it. Hang in there, I'll tell you. And it's going, you know what it's going to take? Faith. It's going to take a working faith on our part. And so we find that when faith serves God, the Lord is my helper. Number two, a faith that serves God shows you you're to show your faith by your Works. Show your faith by your works. In James 2.18, the Bible says, Yea, a man may say that thou hast faith, and I have works. See, we got two men here. One says they have faith, and one says they have works. Okay, that's what you got here. There are two men talking here. Amen. All right? One says, I've got faith, and another one says, well, I have works. So the one says, show me thy faith without thy works. And the other guy says, I will show you my faith by my works. So you see, faith shows our works. Or our works, our faith is shown by our works. Now, you're not talking about being saved there or salvation and all that kind of stuff. He's talking about if you're saved, you're going to work for the Lord. If you have a working faith, you're going to work and serve the Lord. Now, he goes on to say that that faith without works is dead. Uh, You you may not be saved because if you don't have any works in your life, then how can you have faith? Because to have faith, you've got to have works to go with it. Because without it, it's dead. So, you see, we need that. So, we find that that, uh, under working faith, a faith is trusting God. A faith serves God. And thirdly, a faith moves God. Faith moves God in verse 6. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. I've said it many a time now. You know, God sees our heart, and the Bible tells us in the Old Testament, God sees our tears, and he collects them in a bottle. You know, how many tears you got in the bottle? God has a tear bottle, you see. And when we talk about uh, the heart, you see, compassion and mercy move the heart of God. Because God is a God of mercy. Another word for mercy is compassion. God is a God of compassion. He's a God of mercy. How many times we read in the scripture, his mercy endureth forever. His compassion endureth forever. Goodness and mercy, goodness and compassion follows me all the days of my life. And I'm glad that and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen? Amen. And, and thank God for his compassion. Thank God for his mercy. And, and, and so that moves the heart of God because he is a merciful and compassionate God. And he loves us and has compassion on mercy in us. And he sees our tears. But hey, we're talking about moving the hand of God. And faith moves the hand, not the tears. Tears moves the heart. Faith moves the hand. Amen. So we want to move the hand of God tonight in your life, in our church. So we've looked at the first thing Paul said, I remember you in my prayers for your working faith. What a testimony that this church had of a working faith. Well, then secondly, notice what he said there about them in the verse, verse 3. He said they had a labor of love, a laboring faith. Not only a working faith, we need a laboring faith. And he said there, A, he said a labor in love. And that labor and love he's talking about there is a sustainable love. And someone says, well, what's a sustainable love? Well, I'm glad you asked. A, love that lasts a long time. Love that lasts a long time. And be there to help you out, to follow along. Love that keeps working. That keeps on keeping on. Loving the Lord in all of our actions both in our lives and in our church. 
We need to have a labor of love, a laboring of faith, a laboring faith of love that, is, that lasts as long, that is sustainable, that it keeps working, a, a, a loving a, the Lord in all of our actions, and we need to have a love that keeps our first love. We need to have a laboring love that keeps our first love. The church of Ephesus writing in Revelation 2, 5, the Bible says, Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen. Now something had fallen in the church of Ephesus. Jesus came to them in the church of Revelation. And in his letter, this is the first letter to the first church. And, and he says to them, Nevertheless, I know your works, but nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee. And he says, Remember therefore, remember from whence thou art fallen and repent and do your first works. Or else I will come unto thee quickly and remove thy candlestick out of the place except thou repent. And their first works, they were on fire for God. They loved the Lord. They were a soul winning church. They were winning souls. And all of a sudden that all went by the wayside. And the Lord comes back to them and says, man, you need to return to your first love. Get back to your first love and do your first works. Well, there's a labor in love, but we also need to have a labor for others. Loving each other, kind-hearted, tender-hearted, forgiving one another. That's in Ephesians 4.32. You might want to write that down, and Colossians repeats that also almost. And that's why, you see, when I gave you Revelation 2.5, to remember their first love. Because in Revelation 2.4, the Bible says the church of Ephesus left their first love. And that was a love for souls. It was a love for people. And they left that, and in verse 5, Jesus says, Remember and do your first works again. Amen. Now, when we get over to 2 Peter, turn to 2 Peter, and let's take a look at 2 Peter for a minute. You'll need to open your Bibles and turn to 2 Peter there with me. After James, you've got 2 Peter, and let's take a look at 2 Peter tonight. We're talking about a labor for others. If we're going to have a laboring faith, the first thing we need is a labor in love. Need a labor in love, a lasting love, a keeping love, an action love. All right, are you with me? Say amen. amen. All right, and now we need to labor for others. We need to love each other, be kind, tenderhearted, forgiving, so forth. All right, so let's look at 2 Peter 1, uh, verses 6 through 9. All right, 2 Peter chapter 1. Everybody there in 2 Peter chapter 1? All right, here we go. Beginning in verse number 6. Back up in verse 5 then. And besides this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue. It's another word for excellent. And to virtue, knowledge. And to knowledge, temperance. And to temperance, patience. And to patience, godliness. And to godliness, brotherly kindness. And to brotherly kindness, charity or love. Now these are the things we're to add to our faith. Okay, we're talking about having a working faith. Now we're talking about having a laboring faith, a faith of a laboring of love. And he says we need to add these things to it. Now watch what happens if not. Look at verse 8. For if these things in you, all right, if these things, what things? The ones we just read there in verses 6 and 7. Be in you and what? Abound. They grow. That's why I said there in 2 Peter 1, 9, we're not to be forgetful. We're to add to growth. If we don't add to growth, then we're going to be blind and we can't see afar off. Amen. Okay, listen to what he says. They make you that you shall never be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. I don't want to be uh, unfruitful. I don't want to be, have not have knowledge in the Lord. And I won't if I will let, make sure that those things are in me. But look at verse 9 now. Okay. But he that lacketh these things. What things? The ones we just read in verses 6 and 7. If you lack these things, it is what? Blind and cannot see afar off and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. See, that's why we want to labor for the Lord. We want to have it in a labor of love and a labor for others because we don't want to forget that we have been purged from our sins. How many of you have been purged from your sins tonight? Have you forgotten that? Has it been so long you've been saved 40, 50 years and you've forgotten that you've been purged from your sins? Well, I hope not. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. That's why Jesus said in John 9, 4, Jesus had said, hey, he was telling the fellows, listen, the night cometh when no man can work. 
See, we're talking about work, a labor of love, a laboring faith. See, it's a work of faith. We have a working faith. We have a laboring faith. That laboring faith must be done in love. It must be a sustainable love, a lasting love, a, a keeping, working love, you see. And it must be a, an action, a love of action, and, and so forth. And, and, and he tells us that's what we need to do. And we need to add those things because if we don't, we're, we're going to be blind and we can't see it far off. Amen. We won't be able to see anything. That's why Jesus said, listen, church, listen, people. His disciples, he said, man, I'm telling you what, the night's coming when no man can work. Now, folks, don't, don't take that and say, well, uh, you know, well, nighttime comes here in a few hours. It's going to get dark, so we can't work. Um, really, now when winter comes, we're going to be having church on Wednesday night and Sunday night just like we do now. And guess what? It's going to be night. And you know what we're doing? Some of us are working. Amen. I'm working tonight. Amen. Some of you are playing the piano and guitar. You're working. Some of you are working sound and television and radio. You know what? You're working. Some of you work in the Internet. You're working. And it's nighttime, so that's not what he's talking about. There's visitation programs at night. There's revivals at night. There's crusades at night. I mean, there's all kinds of work in the ministry done at night. That's not what he was talking about. There's going to come a time when you're going to close your eyes in death at night, and you're not going to be able to work anymore. And so he was encouraging why you still can get out and do something for Christ. Because the night's going to come when we can't work anymore. One of these days we're going to close our eyes in death and all of our work will cease. And only what's done for Christ is what's going to last. I'm mean, concerned about one of our, our family members and, you know, they're just they're caught up in, 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 you know, being successful and, and making money. And there's nothing wrong with that within itself. But don't let, it put, let that become before you and the Lord. Don't put that first in your life. Why? Because all of that is temporal. None of that is eternal. None of that will last for Christ or eternity. It has no eternal effect on somebody. Only what's done for Jesus is what's going to last. That's eternal. So don't put all of your energy and your efforts into all of that and not do nothing for Jesus. Because guess what? You're going to get old one day and you're going to die and your eyes are going to close and the night has come. But guess what? You may not get old and die. You might die in an accident tomorrow. And guess what? Night has come. And your opportunity to do for Christ is over. Amen. That's why I say only what we do for Christ right now. I have but one life. And that life that I live, whatever I do for Christ, will last for all eternity. Amen. It will have an eternal impact on everything. And whatever everything else outside of that is temporal. It's not going to last for eternity. And eventually it's going to be burned up. How about that? So, hey, man, the night's coming, church. That's why we need to labor for others. We need to labor in love. And then and thirdly, we need to labor with God. Amen. Labor with God. You know why? Because look at 1 Corinthians 3, 9. It's right there in your notes. For we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry and ye are God's building. did not like to know that when you're doing this work, you're doing it with God. He's working with you. See, David was working tonight. He's up here getting sweat under his arms. Because that's what happens when it's hot in here and you're waving your arms leading music. It gets warm. Believe me. I feel it. Some of you are out there fanning tonight. Warm already. Because it's warm outside. 97, 98 at 4 o'clock today. Right, folks, that's getting up there. And so, bless God, do we labor with God just think that he's our partner in this work and this labor. We're not doing this alone. We're doing it with him. Praise the Lord. Amen. Now, what do we labor with God? I think there are two wonderful things that we can labor in with God. All right, first of all, number one, we can labor with God in prayer. In prayer. You can labor with God in prayer. James 5, 16 says this, Confess your faults one to another, and pray for one another that ye may be healed. Why? Because the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. In other words, it's going to be effective and powerful. Amen. So you see, we can be co laborers with God in this work in laboring of faith because that's what Paul said I'm remembering you in our prayers. And he said, other passage, he says, and we cease not to pray for you night and day. And so when we're, we're confessing false one to another, that's what I'm doing to you all here up all the time. 
I'm all the time telling you, oh, my fault, I messed up, made a mistake, I got nervous this week, I got a little bit scared, a little bit worried and frustrated and stressed out, you know, and all this stuff, and we're not to be anxious for anything, amen. We're to trust God for everything, and the finances are down, we're to trust God and all this stuff, so what am I doing? I'm confessing my faults to you, because why? I want you to pray for me, because I want to be healed. Okay? And I know you want the same thing. Amen. So we, we just think we get to co-labor with God in prayer. Communicating to the Lord. Talking to the Lord. Another thing we can, pray, uh, we can labor with God in, and that is in His strength, not yours. In His strength. Listen to what the psalmist wrote in Psalm 18 too. I love this. Look how many things he said here. This is fantastic. He said, the Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength, in whom I will trust. What is faith? It's trusting in God. Amen. Are you with me? Say amen. He's my buckler and the horn of my salvation and my high tower. Folks, it doesn't get any better than that. And you can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth you, right? So these are two areas that we can labor with God in. Now, folks, that's not hard or difficult. People start saying, well, we've got to labor, we've got to work, man. What do we got to do? How long? How much? Man, this is going to be tough. This is going to be hard. Is prayer that tough and that hard? It may be for some because they simply don't do it. You've got to take the time to do it. You got to set aside some time and, and, and to talk to the Lord and to pray. And my goodness, to get out and walk. Walk the neighborhood, walk your lot, walk your field where you live, your property. Come out here and walk the church. You got 14 acres here you can walk on. That's a long walk around this property. And, and, and it also will help you get a little bit tired, build up strength in your legs and muscles because you're not walking on asphalt. You're walking on grass and sand, and, and that all gives and moves, and, and it's a little more effort to walk like that. And you burn a little more calories and, uh, calories and a few more energy. And you know what? You can come out here and you can talk to the Lord all you want and yell as loud as you want. Amen. Now, don't yell too loud because you might wake up Steve. Amen. Okay? And, and you can talk to the Lord. Now, you can talk to the Lord riding your bike. You can talk to the Lord while you're on your treadmill. You can talk to the Lord while you're driving your car. Just don't get too caught up in it and pay attention to what you're doing, you know. Like poor David, I was talking to David this morning. That's how things go. He thought oh, it was a great weekend. I was trying to get home as quick as I can. I just wanted to get home. And I was coming through Gainesville, and I got there on 24th in the main intersection there of Gainesville. And I was sitting there to light, and bam, guy hit me. He said, I knew he was going to hit me. I was watching him in my lights. I didn't hit the guy in front of me. I stopped and waited. And here he comes. And I said, I, and I said, I said to myself, he ain't going to stop. And sure enough, he didn't. I said, well, how bad was the damage? He said, well, it wasn't too bad. He said, uh, my taillights didn't get messed up. Uh, he said, I'm not even sure about the tail guy. I didn't even look really. And uh, his headlights and everything weren't torn up. And I said, well, wow, what happened? He said, he got hooked to my car, my truck. And they couldn't get him unhooked. And when the, uh, uh, I guess the, the fire department and them came and so forth, you know, because they always come to an accident, a sweep up or wash down and everything, and the first responders, and, and they said, can you, you know, since it doesn't look too bad, uh, can you go on and let's get out, because it's a main intersection there in Gainesville. He said, can we get out of this intersection? And David said, well, I'd like to, but he's hooked to my car, truck. He says, well, can you move him? And David said, well, I'll try. And he <laughs> drove off with the guy's car hooked to his bumper. So it kind of messed up his, his day a little bit. You know what I mean? And so that's why I say when you're praying to the Lord while you're driving, you need to pay attention. You know, make sure you don't run into the guy in front of you or whatever. But, oh, it, it's fun. I, I, I love it. It's a great time to talk to the Lord, especially if you've got a drive to make. You know, you're going to drive to Gainesville to here. You've got a 45, 50-minute drive. There's a great way to go back 225 here or go the back way back through there or go down 441. It's a beautiful drive down 441. No traffic out there. Nobody's out there. And you can just talk to the Lord all you want to. And you've got a 45, 50 minute drive where you and God can just be alone and you can talk out loud because there's nobody in the car listening to you but the Lord. You know, I mean, and pray. 
Jesus said, go in your closet and pray. When you pray secretly in your closet, he said, I'll reward you openly. Amen. But just take time to pray. Be a co-laborer with God in prayer. And, be, and, and let's do our laboring in his strength, not our own strength. That's why so many get burned out so easily and give up so easy and quick. So they get, they get burned out, they get weary, they get tired and well doing and so forth because they're trying to do it in your own strength. And you're not going to do it in your own strength. You've got to do it in the strength of the Lord. Amen. I mean, and, and that's how it has to be done around here. Uh, all, everything that goes on around here and does everything has to be done in the strength of the Lord. You know, and I am just amazed at some of our workers here. And, and I am just grateful for them and appreciate them. The, the job that they do, and it's the same job, week after week, the same thing, whether even to here in the church or over in the office or up there. You realize how many years that man's been sitting up there doing that? At least 10. Faithful, dedicated, committed to it. And to my knowledge, he's never missed a service. Even when he's sick. You see, now, he can't do that in his own strength. Because he'd be burnt out already. Amen. And he may be. But he's hanging in there. Because the Lord's coming. Right. And he might come tonight. Yeah. And we won't have to do this anymore. At least not all of it. But oh, labor in his strength. Well, thirdly tonight, we're done. So the first thing we looked at, what was the first? What was the, a working faith. The second was a laboring faith. And the third there, he was praising the Lord and remembering their patient faith. They had a patient faith. And he talked about they were patient in hope. Now church, what is our hope? Our blessed hope is the coming of the Lord. That's our blessed hope. Now listen, some of us have been around for 50, 60, 70 years. Some of us have been saved 50 and 60 years. Some of us have been hearing this preached and thought about this for 50 and 60 years. And, and, you know, and you're wondering, okay, when's it going to happen? When's it going to come? Is it going to be in my lifetime? Whatever. No, you need patience in that hope. Don't you give up. You got to remember when Paul was teaching here to, and opened this passage up, this is the opening of 1 Thessalonians. In 1 Thessalonians, all those five chapters or whatever, he taught them about the coming of the Lord, the rapture of the church. And then they were all upset because, well, there were many of their loved ones had died and they were going to miss the rapture of the church. And he said, no, no, don't let that bother you. Don't let that get you upset because the dead in Christ are going to rise first. And then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them uh, to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. That's 1 Thessalonians. Then you get over to 2 Thessalonians and he introduces us to the second coming of Christ. But the first the coming of the Antichrist. So there's this patient in hope. That's A. Then there's a wonderful word that's used in the Old Testament. It's called Selah. You read a lot of the Psalms and you'll see it says Selah, Selah. Uh, and so I had to see what that word meant. The word uh, means pause. You got to take a pause, a time out. You got to be patient in your faith in the Lord. Patient in your faith in your work for the Lord. Patient in your faith in your love for the war Lord. Everything we talked about here takes patience. We need to wait. What are we waiting for, church? We are waiting for God's Son to return from heaven. That's what we're waiting for, and that's going to take patience. It's going to take patience. Hope for, to wait for God's Son from heaven, number one, because we hope for Jesus coming again. That's what we're hoping for. As a matter of fact, the church has been patiently waiting for the coming of the Lord for 2,000 years. Or, my brother Peter would say, only two days. See, we've got to be patient. Amen. Patient as we wait for the coming. So there's the patience and hope. There's the pause of hope. And then there's the wait for Jesus to return. This is all this patient. And Paul is praising them, remembering this wonderful uh, example, model church of the New Testament. Amen. Now, isn't that interesting that Paul was telling them that their patience of their hope, they were waiting for the return of the Lord then, and now 2,000 years later, guess what? The church, which is what we are, which is what they were, we're still waiting for the, for the coming of the Lord. 
But you see, in God's timetable, church, it's only two days. For us, it's been 2,000 years. Listen, see, God doesn't, you know, Peter says, a day is as a thousand, a thousand as a day. All right? And I'm a dispensationalist and believe in dispensational times. And we have dispensational times through all out the Scripture. Many dispensation of times and spans. And so we have that. And so it's just to praise God. Amen. All right? From Adam and Eve again to the flood. Amen. Which we talked about this morning. Okay, the flood. God said, I'm going to destroy the world with a flood. When God did that, that was 2,000 years since Adam came on the planet. Okay, and from the flood, there was 2,000 years to where Christ was born. Amen. In Bethlehem, that's 4,000 years. And from now, from then, to Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection, to this present time we're living in, is 2,000 years. That's 6,000 years or six days. A day is as a thousand, a thousand is a day. We got one more period. We got one more dispensation of time. It's called the millennial reign of Christ, which is one more thousand years, which is one more day, the seventh day. And that's what we're awaiting. And we need to have patient faith. Most of us want everything and we want it now. Most of us want it yesterday. You know, it's my money and I want it now. You know the commercial, right? And so uh, you go to somebody, you want to get something or have something done and say, when would you like this done? Well, I would have liked it done yesterday. And they tell you, well, it's going to be three or four weeks or a month before we can get to it, you see. But we want it now. But God says, no, you're going to have to have a patient faith. Remember what we learned a few weeks ago in one of the messages in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31? They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles, right? They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk in night faint. Teach me, Lord, to wait. Amen? We're going to have to have a patient faith. It's a patience of hope. Then it needs to be an expecting in hope. We need to have that expecting in hope. Matter of fact, the Jews are waiting for their Messiah. And what are we waiting for? We're waiting for God's Son from heaven. The believer. So there must be. And that's why while you're in 1 Thessalonians right there, if you would have dropped down, we read verses 7, 8, and 9 as we talked about that. If you'd have read the very next verse in 10, verse 10, you would have read, you would have read something wonderful there in verse 10. And to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. Aren't you glad you've been delivered from the wrath to come? Amen. First Thessalonians 1.10. Let's read it. And to wait. There's that patience of hope. To wait for his son. What are we waiting for as a believer? It's a New Testament church. We're waiting for his son from heaven. Whom he raised. God raised from the dead. Who's God's son? He tells you right there. Even Jesus. Which delivered us from the wrath to to come. That's why Paul went over in, in Corinthians in 5 9 and says, God has not appointed us unto wrath, but to obtain salvation. Amen. And when you get over to Revelation, in Revelation chapter 3, in the, in the church of the church of Philadelphia, the sixth church, God promised the church of Philadelphia, the soul winning church, which was in the 1800s era, if we go by time period again, dispensation of time, all right? He said, I will keep you from the hour of temptation. And the word keep there is the word ek, the Greek word ek, E-K, which means out of. Not preserve you through it, but out of. I will keep you out of the tribulation hour. I will keep you out of the wrath of God that's coming upon the planet. And we wait for that precious moment in time with patience because we got to have a patient faith. Amen. God raised Jesus from the dead. So Jesus could deliver the Christian from the wrath of God. That's what verse 10 says. And, the, and, and don't miss this now. We didn't read verse 4. We did verses 1 through 3 in our text. I want to take you back to verse 4 now as we close it out. Look at verse 4, 1 Thessalonians. Knowing. Well, see, we're supposed to know something, right? After we read verses 1 through 3, look what he says. Knowing, brethren, beloved, your election of God. What we just read, it was chosen by God. What was the church? 
the church and the believer in the body of Christ was chosen by God. If you read these verses again, Paul and Silas and Timothy, unto the church. What? Unto the church. And that church is in God and it's in the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be unto you and so forth. We give thanks for you, making mention of you of our prayers always, remembering your work of faith, your labor of love, your patience and love in our Lord Jesus Christ, in the sight of God and our Father, knowing, brethren, beloved, your election of God. The church was chosen by God. And if you're a part of the church of the body of Christ, you too have been elected and chosen by God. So living by faith is what we need to put to practice in our lives as individuals and in the life of our church. Faith moves the hand of God. Now church, if you expect great things from God, you got to do great things for God. Hello. Got to step off by faith. I'm still praying, trusting, believing God that one day we will be on seven days a week on Super Channel 55. And at a different and earlier time. And I believe it will pick up our audience, listening audience, tremendously. I believe our DVD and, and CD ministry will triple and quadruple and we will need more people in the office to do the labor of work and do it in a labor of love. Amen. Yellow. Amen. I'm praying for the day that God will provide the finances that we will go on the Good Life channel, channel 45. I'm praying that God will let us to go on the church channel, Amen. channel 23, I believe, or 21. You see, I expect great things for God. And I want to believe and trust God that he will trust us and trust this church with the message of his gospel that he will put us out there so that people can hear the truth and unfortunately and sadly not a lot of the other stuff that they're hearing. Amen. And you say, man, that would almost be impossible. It's not impossible. We're on Super Channel 55. Who'd ever believe we would go on that? You see, who would ever believe? But you see, with our faith and trust in God, God sent a man here. Saw the clear blue sky. Shows up, takes me to lunch. Carol and I that day after church took us to lunch, Claude did. Super Channel 55. And he said, uh, I want you to be on Super Channel 55. And I, I looked at Claude and I said, you, you gotta, you got to be kidding me. First of all, we're a nobody and a no name and everything else. And, and you know, you're, you're the big boys. I mean, that's the big channel. It's one of the most powerful Christian television stations in the state of Florida. And it goes into 8 to 10 million homes now. It covers from the west coast to the east coast. From south of Orlando all the way to north of, of Gainesville. Amen. And I said, Claude, we can't afford that. And he, again, do you want to be on Super 55? I want you to be on Super 55. He said, I want a good Bible preaching teaching church from Ocala to be on my station. And why did he choose us? God chose that. And I said, we can't afford it. Because, see, I had already contacted Channel 45, the Good Life Channel. And had a meeting, an appointment to go see with them, to sit and speak with them and the, the producers of the station. And, I, and they said, what are you looking for? I said, well, I'm looking for a, a decent time, maybe 7, 8, 9 o'clock at night would be a nice time. And we run a one-hour program. And they said that would be $1,400 an hour. So when Claude said, I want you to be on our program, he's bigger than they are. And I said, well, uh, that's nice, Claude. I appreciate that. But I'm thinking in my head, there's no way we got $1,400 an hour to go on television. Not on your program. Now, on, on Cox, I'm not even going to say what we pay for Cox because everybody else will want in on it. It's phenomenal. He said, do you want to be on TV on my station? And I will give you a time. He said, you'll follow me, my show, my program. So and I've got a pretty good listening audience. Claude did. 
so you'll follow me. And he said it'll be on Saturday night at 11 o'clock. Well, I wasn't too excited about that, but hey, he's calling the shots here, man. And he said, this will only cost you 250 And I said, you got to be kidding me. I came to the church and I said, church, we got a chance and an opportunity from the Lord to go on the big boy channel with our church and our ministry. And they said, let's do it, the people that were here. And they have been so faithfully to give to that. We've never missed a payment. And we've been on there with Claude now going on our seventh year, I believe. We've been with Cox for over 12, almost 15 years with Cox. So there's no reason why, even in an economy, see, the economy doesn't bother God. He can do above and beyond exceedingly what we can even think or ask. And I'm asking God for channel 45. Amen. I've been asking God for the church channel. And I've been asking God to speak to Claude's heart that he would bump us up to at least 9 o'clock or 8 o'clock on Saturday. And then I wanted to talk to him about a super deal for getting us on there at least two to three times a week, like a Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday service. Give us a shot, Claude. Give us a chance. Amen. See what God will do. See if people will get behind it and promote it. And I mean the people, the listeners out there, and support it. And as far as I'm concerned, you can have the money. I don't want the money. I want the television time. I'm not in this for money. I'm in this to get the gospel out. And whatever it takes. And God can speak to Claude's heart. No question about it. He's a good man. He's got a good heart. He's got a giving heart. I believe if God just speaks to his heart just a little bit, we can put that bug in his ear. He like what he did when he drove down here. He literally drove down, for, drove up here from Orlando, came to our church that Sunday, took me out to lunch, and said, I want you on Super Channel 55. And I said, Claude, we can't afford it. He said, do you want to be on? Three times he asked me. I said, okay, fine, what do we got to do? And when he told me, I, I, I just, man, I should have said something earlier. Amen. 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 So praise God, praise God. Let's go home. Let's go home. We've had a good day today. Father, thank you for today. We love you. We praise you. Thank you for this model church, the Thessalonian believers at Thessalonica, the testimony that they had, that they were a church of a working faith, a laboring faith of love, and a patient faith of hope. Father, pray that we would have that same testimony, and we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Praise the Lord. Amen.